Hello everybody. This is our third talk on evolutionary biology. You may remember that in our last talk we ended by talking about how evolution is tree-like due to the bifurcation of populations where one species splits into two and then those populations may go on and split into other species. And I showed you this picture. And so today I want to explore a little bit about the tree-like nature of evolution and we're going to start by saying well what are some of the implications of this tree-like or what we might call clade-like nature of evolution. And that word clade I will be introducing later in the unit. So what can we deduce from the tree-like nature of evolution? Well the first thing is that all life has a single common ancestor. That's pretty impressive and we're going to talk about that a little more later on in the unit. Secondly, this means that all species are related. Take any two species and trace their lineage back far enough and you will find a single ancestral population that they are derived from. Thirdly, the common ancestor between any two species was different from its modern or extant, which means currently living, descendants. So for example, that means we can't say that humans evolved from monkeys, but we can say that humans are monkeys because humans belong to the evolutionary branch that includes all monkeys. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Finally, traits are developed at a certain point in history in a certain population. And then all of that population's descendants possess that trait unless something else happens to that trait in evolution. But that's going to turn out to be really important. I think many of you already know why that's so important. Now first we want to get some language to understand evolutionary trees. So the evolutionary tree shows relationships in reference to ancestry. So in this example we have three groups A, B, and C. And the reason they're called taxon is because that can refer to any taxonomic group, a species. So taxon A could be blue jay and taxon B could be robin and taxon C could be wren or it could re refer to families of birds, let's say. So taxon A could be warblers, taxon B could be vireos, and taxon C could be woodpeckers. So that's why we call it a taxon. It refers to any taxonomic category. So in this example, taxon A and B are each other's closest relative. And why are they each other's closest relative? Because they contain the most recent common ancestor seen here as the common ancestor of A and B. So A and B share a more recent common ancestor than A does with C or B does with C. So that's the important thing here to know. That's what evolutionary trees tell us. Who is most related to who? In this case, these three species occur, we can say they occur in the present, and then going this way, going vertically downwards is going backwards in time. And so that's important that you know that. This population, the ancestor of A and B, is no longer alive, but it existed sometime in the past. And this common ancestor here of all three existed farther back in the past, which is why A and B are more closely related to each other than either of them is to C. So how are evolutionary trees made? Well, by inference, of course. And you've already done that. As we saw in Race Through the Woods, that lab exercise we did, we can understand the history of life and reconstruct an evolutionary tree by using the characters of species to infer what the evolutionary tree must look like. We start with the simple assumption that if two organisms share a character, it came from their common ancestor. Caricature states that evolved within the tree are said to be derived. So, for example, in this tree, hair is the derived character state of mammals. And you can see that right here because it evolved within this tree. And no hair is the opposite of the derived trait. And that's called an ancestral trait. So something that happened before the derived trait is the ancestral trait. Lack of limbs in this tree is ancestral because ray finned fish and sharks lacked limbs, but everything after this point here, the amphibians, primates, rodents, and rabbits, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds, all have four limbs. 
This leads to an important idea, and the idea is called homology. If two species have a character state that they inherited from a common ancestor, that character state is said to be homologous. So, for example, the limb bones in all four-legged animals are homologous. Here we have a turtle, and its forelimb, meaning its front limb, is composed of one longer, thicker bone, two thin bones, a lot of little bones, and then digits. Here we have the front fin of a dolphin, one thick bones, two thinner bones, lots of little bones, digits. Here's a human, one long bone two thinner bones, lots of little bones, digits. Here's a horse, thick, two short, little bones, and then they have a single digit. The other digits have been lost in evolutionary time. Now look at a bat, a thicker bone, two thin bones, lots of little bones, digits. A bird, same pattern, except they only have three digits and that's in the wing of a bird. So now we know what a homology is, but as you probably guessed, some character states that are displayed by organisms can cause confusion when trying to infer or put together the evolutionary tree. And two types of confusing events are called homoplasies and reversals. So let's look at them. Because the earth is old and the environment has changed many times, organisms have many traits that cause confusion. Sometimes the same trait evolves more than once. Huh? Well, let's look. For example, there are three different groups of vertebrates, birds, pterosaurs, and bats, that have evolved wings. Now, before I go on and explain that in a little more detail, let me just tell you that the word vertebrates refers to all of the animals that have a backbone. And the possession of a backbone was inherited from a single common ancestor and is homologous in all of these groups. Birds, bats, and pterosaurs have all evolved flight. And since the common ancestor of each pair of species did not have wings, and we know this from the fossil record, flight has evolved separately in each group. So let's take a look at the evolutionary tree. Here we see pterosaurs right here. Here we see birds, and we can see their birds are actually dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs, you may have been taught as a child that dinosaurs have gone extinct, but they didn't. They survive as birds, and birds are in fact dinosaurs. And then that group of dinosaurs is, sister group, is pterosaurs. Now pterosaurs were flighted and birds are flighted, but this common ancestor back here we know from the fossil record did not have flight. And this common ancestor of all dinosaurs did not have wings, was not flighted. So we can infer that flight must have evolved somewhere in the pterosaur lineage and somewhere in the bird or Sariscian dinosaur lineage. There may be some flighted Sariscian dinosaurs too. That's what we mean when we say that flight is called homoplasius. It evolved more than once. And the wings are said to be analogous as opposed to homologous. So can you see why a homoplasius trait causes confusion when it is used to reconstruct an evolutionary tree? It might be a good idea for you to stop the video and write down your answer to that question. Let's take a look at analogous structures for a second just to make this clear. Here we have the wing of a moth, a pterodactyl, a bird, and a bat. The interesting thing that you can see here is that the wings are all analogous, that's why they're in purple, meaning that the common ancestor of any pair of these was itself a non-winged creature. Confusion might be had because the bones that support the wings of pterodactyls, birds, and bats are homologous. They are the same bones just rearranged in evolutionary time. And I think the pterodactyl is so amazing because the wing, the entire wing, is hung on the fourth finger. In other words, the pterodactyl's fourth finger has become incredibly long and the wing is hanging off it. We have analogous wings, homologous bones in the wings of the vertebrates, but the support system for the wing of a moth, these veins in here, are in fact an analogous support system, so they're not homologous at all. 
Hopefully you understand the difference between homologous structures and analogous structures. Maybe you should think of some examples of each and come to class with any questions about them. Now, there's another type of confusion that happens, and that's evolutionary reversals. Huh? What do we mean by that? Well, land animals, which are called tetrapods, and themselves are a unique evolutionary group, things with four limbs. They were all inherited from a single common ancestor. Tetrapods evolved from fish-like ancestors, as we're going to discuss later on in this unit. And whales then later evolved from terrestrial tetrapods, meaning land-based tetrapods. And they underwent a reversal by losing their hind limbs and developing pectoral fins from their front limbs, a fin tail, and a streamlined body so that they look a lot like fish. And here is the family tree of whales. And you can see that the original whale ancestors were fully terrestrial and then they became more and more aquatic over time until this thing that probably never came out of the water and has only shown up on land for illustrative purposes. These events are called reversal. The loss of limbs in whales is a reversal. The development of streamlined body and a fin tail is a reversal. And so can you see why a reversal can cause confusion when constructing an evolutionary tree? Once again, I recommend you stop the video and write an answer in your notes to that. So where are we at this point? We've learned about the ideas that preceded Darwin and about the key experiences in Darwin's life that led him to understand that evolution must be true. Actually, this year we didn't do that, but in other years we will do that. We understand what evolution means and how natural selection brings about adaptation. We have an idea of what a species is and how new species evolve through reproductive isolation. And we've seen that the history of life is tree-like. And we have learned the theory behind how an evolutionary tree can be inferred from the data about living organisms. So now what we want to look at is why evolution, 160 years after Darwin first proposed it in his famous book, The Origin of Species. Why is that idea still controversial, even though it is a scientific fact? And in fact, we're going to spend most of our time looking at the evidence that makes us say evolution is a scientific fact. That's it for today. Until next time, go outside, observe nature, think about the biology of nature, and ask biological questions. And I'll see you next time.